not more of this. Boo! Get on. Yeah, yeah, okay, I get it, I hear you. I, yes, yes, it's too much carving, I know, I know. Okay, look. It's almost done. This episode has hardly any carving in it. I promise. I'm sorry it started out this way. Just, just hang in there, okay? Someone to take control of this disgusting, embarrassing mess. He doesn't give a fuck. He's dreaming. He's standing there, pissed in his pants, looking for his tartar and caviar, white chocolate crap, and he's just running around like a toilet brush. Is anyone going to take control? Okay, so I spent all this time heating and beating the clay so that I can fill in the undercuts of these uh, armor pieces. Uh, you know what, you're, you're gonna see in a minute. Just, just hang in there, there's gonna be rubber involved. It's gonna be, it's gonna be great, great and rubbery. Um, I'm doing this little edge thing because I need to smash it down against the bottom and I don't want the rubber to ooze underneath. where all those years of making snakes is finally paying off. So I'm going to be doing a lot of mold making here, and uh, if the stuff that I explain uh, doesn't seem thorough enough for you, uh, have no fear, I'm going to be doing several mold making tutorials as soon as I'm done with the Shadow Colossus series. They're going to be great. I think.
right, so what I have been using is this Mold Max 20, the pourable urethane rubber. I ran out of it. Um, I still have a couple fairly large pieces to do, which is unfortunate because um, the only place that sells this stuff locally to me is closed on Sundays. And tomorrow's some other holiday, so I can't. Anyway, point is I'm kind of trying to make do with what I have right now. Um, one of the things that I have is this Tap Plastics Urethane RTV system. I do not recommend this stuff. Every time I've used it, I've been disappointed, but it's what I have on hand, so I'm gonna try it on a few little pieces that it's not a big deal if it has the problems that I've encountered in the past. The problems that I've encountered in the past are it makes a, um, it sticks to the sculpture. Even like I put a very liberal coating of Vaseline on there that should keep anything from sticking to it. Even then it's had problems where it just binds onto there and then tears when you pull it apart. The other problem that it has is the mold you have when you're done is um, crumbly. Like it just, this is a terrible product. Um, I thought maybe it was because the stuff I had was old, so I got a new batch of it recently, tried it again, same problem. So maybe I'm doing something wrong. Maybe there's something in the atmosphere here. I don't know. If you've had good luck with it, great. I have not. So anyway, I'm gonna do that for a couple little pieces. And then there was one art store that was open today, and so I got Rebound 25. Now this is not a pourable, um, like it shows on the box there. It's not a pourable, it's a brush on, which means I have to mix it together and then like stipple it on with the brush, coat after coat after coat. It's super annoying, but it's better than waiting a week or whatever I'd have to wait to continue the process. So here we go. First, we're going to do this uh, pourable tap plastics urethane. Okay, we're going to set these aside for seven days. Seriously? Seven days, they say, to demold. Wow. Okay, we'll come back to that in a week. Uh, let me show you real quick. So, you see a lot of these molds that I was doing are almost completely covered with the clean clay, and that is to minimize the amount of the super expensive urethane rubber that's covering it. So basically, it's as small a cavity as possible in there to fill. Now, since I prepped these pieces to do the same pourable mold, uh, they're all covered up funny, but since I now have to use a brush on um, rubber, I'm gonna have to uncover them. I just thought that was cool how that looks like a um, like a Cyclops alien or something. But anyway, now I'm tearing this out. Because I'm gonna need to use this brush and tap on a ton of rubber. In fact, I may have to completely remove these from the box. That was an annoying waste of a lot of time. But that is the price you pay for doing stuff as a human without complete knowledge of everything. If you happen to have access to complete knowledge to everything, let me know where that is. I'd love to access that because it would have been cool to just, you know, look at all these pieces and say, how much rubber am I gonna need to cover these? And then I would have seen that a gallon wasn't enough, but. There are actual ways to calculate that. Like you could actually pour water into your mold, pour it out into a container and then you get the exact amount, but then you have to wait days for it to dry or put it in a heater. Well heater probably wouldn't work with the clean clay because that gets melty and soggy. Not soggy, uh, floppy. The really nice thing about clean clay though is that you just throw it in a bucket and use it next time. So 
So it says here the pot life of this Rebound 25 is 20 minutes. So I can't mix up a giant batch and then just glob on it forever. I need to mix up smaller batches that will take probably going to shoot for 10 to 15 minutes or less to get it on there. So here we go. Always nice to have a surface to work on so when your rubber falls down around the edges it's not going to stick to a table or whatever. For the first coat you don't want to go too thick. You want it actually pretty darn thin because you want to be able to see any bubbles that form and be able to pop them. That is the downside in my experience with using brush on as opposed to pour rubber. So it's a lot easier to get little bubbles trapped in it. Oh, pro tip number 17, when you're, um, after you've opened this stuff and you've used some of it but not all of it, put it in like a gallon Ziploc bag and try to push all the air out of it, seal it up really well, that'll make the shelf life last longer. Always pour your mixture into a third cup to do, give it a final mix so that you're not accidentally introducing um, scrapings from the side of uh, the cup which will make your mixture uneven. And a new stir stick. Yeah, you just use a cheap uh, chip brush. This one's been used a bit, as you can see, it's tinted a little green. Shouldn't matter. And now I'm trying to dab it into the deepest areas first. With a thin enough coat that I can tell if there's any bubbles or cracks where the rubber hasn't quite got into. This first layer is all about 100% coverage. Not thick coverage, very thin coverage. And then in subsequent layers you can pile it on quite a bit thicker. All right, so you give it about an hour between coats. Once it's to the point where it's um, tacky, but it doesn't stick to your fingers, then it's good to go. Second coat can, of course, be a little bit thicker than the first. Maybe significantly thicker, assuming that your uh, first coat is really um, nice and thin and you're sure there's no bubbles. All right, so I've added three more coats to these guys. And you can see, uh, one of the issues is these uh, protrusions that come out here. The 
rubber is much thinner because gravity pulls it down a bit. Now you can add thickener to to this um, rubber, which is great, but I don't have any. So uh, one solution that I came up with that I did on this piece was I just I put the rubber on and then I flipped it upside down and I have it just propped up on these cups. So it ended up dripping a lot of rubber onto the ground, but it also um, made it so that the peaks of these uh, of these fins are getting better coverage. I think probably one more thick coat should do the trick. So he's got these back bone things that kind of stick out around his scapula. And I'm trying to figure out how to locate them accurately based on his position because his left shoulder is way up high, he's stretching out. His right shoulder is back which uh, and, and down lower. So they're really uh, off kilter, which, which is good. It gives him a sense of dynamism and movement. Um, but the, these, uh, bones that I'm trying to reproduce that, that stick out, um, I can't tell if they're really kind of anchored in that little, in the, um, scapula bone or not. I think I'm going to look up some reference real quick. Okay, so yeah, the scapula are roughly triangular shaped. In humans, and he's got a pretty human upper torso here, there's a kind of ridge that goes from the upper corner down around there, and then another ridge that runs on the inside of the, of the shoulder blade there. That's, when you say shoulder blade, that's usually what you're seeing poke out, is this protuberance and the ridge that goes down from it. So the the bone plates that come out of there don't uh, they can't be this ridge because it's super close to the spine and they sit about halfway between the spine and the outer side of the back here. Can't be this line so it's just kind of a made up line which is fine. I just want to make sure that the um, that wherever it is located, it's consistently located on the right and the left side. So I'm just going to make up a basic. Let's see, let's first, get this symmetrical on both sides. Okay, and then his made-up bone is going to be about I think it's about halfway down the scapula would be fine. Well, it just occurred to me that the shoulder armor plate is pretty extensive. I'm kind of concerned that, especially up here, it might be cutting into that. And sadly, that armor piece is getting molded right now. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold off till I have that armor piece and I can see it in relation to each other. Okay, now that these are all set up, I'm going to put a mother mold over them. I'm using this stuff called Plasti Paste 2. And it's kind of like a, um, 
would describe it like fiberglass for people who don't want the danger and expense of making fiberglass. So I'm going to just, this stuff sticks tenaciously, they say, those are the words they use, to almost everything, including even potentially the rubber. So I'm just gonna cover it with uh, saran wrap because I don't need all the intricate detail. I just need the basic shape of it. You can think of a mother mold in this case as basically being a, it's basically a superstructure that just holds the edges in place. So when you pour your plaster or your, um, your plastic inside the mold, it's not gonna distort. So the closer the mother mold is to exactly this shape, the less di distortion you're gonna get. I'm not super concerned about distortion. This isn't a part that needs to like mechanically fit with other parts or anything. So just getting the basic shape of it will work fine for our case. Otherwise I'd have to use some specialty like wax based um, coat of something which I don't have on hand. Okay, place your bets now. By the time I get this open, our half the content's going to be all over my face. No skipping ahead, that'd be cheap. this I don't know maybe a year ago so this may be the last chance I get to use it regardless so it's uh, two parts of the thick stuff to one part of the thin stuff got 150 milliliters there I'll do 300 oh I'm um, also I'm going to add some of this uh, smooth on so strong tint because I want to test this material out. I'm thinking I might want to use it for the final shell coating for the skin for the Colossus. But I want to see if I can get it to be the right color <clears throat> consistently before I do that. Probably going to end up painting over all the skin anyway, but it's still nice like uh, if the sculpture cracks or gets scratched or whatever, if the actual material that that scratches is the same color as the coat, then it doesn't show up. Check out the consistency of this stuff. It's got like mini fiberglass fibers in there. The reasons I'm considering using this as the skin for the Colossus is A, it's very strong. 
B, it's very light, and I'm already having weight issues with uh, lugging the thing around. And uh, C, I bought a ton of it, so I've got a lot laying around. And I think as far as price goes, it's probably fairly competitive with the other things I was thinking about, which was uh, Bondo was one idea, um, which that's a lot heavier, actually. And, uh, and then like this uh, epoxy sculpt, which this is just really expensive and probably heavier. So we need 300 milliliters of this part. Oh, pretty thick. I haven't run into problems before with uh, getting the ratios uh, super perfect. Like, it's pretty hard since, you know, it sits in the cup like that to tell exactly when it's at 300. So just eyeball it. It works fine. One of the downsides to this is that it only has a 10 minute pot life, so if I'm going to use it as a skin for the Colossus, I'm going to be mixing over and over and over, which would make getting the uh, a consistent color tone pretty difficult unless I, unless I um, mix exactly the same amount every time so I can make sure that the ratio of the pigmentation to the to the plastic paste is the same. That or I could do maths, but the, you know, I'm an artist. I became an artist because I don't want to do the maths. It's just not my strong point. This kind of looks like uh, a lot of the creatures I've been fighting in Bloodborne 3 recently. Not Bloodborne, Dark Souls 3. Looks like creatures from Bloodborne as well. Coincidence? I think not. All right, now we're gonna do the same thing on these molds. They don't need as much because they're a lot uh, more solid being the poured uh, plastic, but you could still use a little bit of reinforcement. mostly in all these areas where I use the clean clay to make these big gaps so that I'm not spending so much money on the rubber so the plastic paste can fill in those gaps really well. back of this is a test so I can sand it and paint it and see how it could work as a potential candidate for Colossus skin all right let's see how these molds turned out now I'm gonna start with the scariest one just to see how the one with holes that I theoretically repaired work Okay, so the mother mold came off just fine. That's nice. All that Vaseline paid off. No, that's what she said jokes. Okay, so now I'm going to remove the actual models from inside. I'm going to do that by incising the inside. These are both 
arm circulate things, like half circles. And the plan is to uh, fill this mold through one of these two holes to cast them. And that means I'm going to need to be able to pull them out. And in theory, oh, there we go. The, the inside of the circle really doesn't matter what it looks like because it's going to be pressed up against the, the flesh of the arm. So if there's gonna be an ugly seam, it really doesn't matter if it's on the inside of it. So there we go, looks like the model came out unscathed. There's the hole where once we pour resin in, it would pour straight out. And hopefully this mother mold will plug that up well enough that, uh, you know, a little cleanup work should, should do the trick, should make it fine. But yeah, we'll see. It's always nice when your mold or when your model comes out of the mold completely intact because if you need to make another mold it's not you don't have to re uh, you don't have to fix it and do it again. Okay. Now you get a sense for what this mother mold does, right? It just keeps it without the mother mold. If I were to pour resin in the mold could get distorted. I could put it down funny or it could, you know, pinch and, and wobble, which would make the uh, seams open up. And then there's just more stuff to clean up afterwards. Put it in the mother mold and it's got, it's set in place. You don't have to worry about that. Oh, wow, look at that. I did not, uh, or rather I should say, I expected um, this, what is it called again? I expected this plastic paste too to stick to the saran wrap, but it didn't. Except for the places where it folded over it a little bit. That's fine. hard to see. I think this mold turned out pretty bubbly unfortunately. Like I can see if you look here there's cavities where it was too bubbly. But again since I'm only making two of these it's not that big a deal to clean those up. It just requires a little more cutting and sanding and stuff. I can see really bad bubbles in this one. Yeah, I don't. The last couple batches of um, the Mold Max 20 or 30, whatever it is that I got, have given me a lot of problems with bubbles. And I'm not sure why. I ordered some thinner that you can put in it that should make it flow better. Um, you sacrifice some, some strength for that, but. Um, since I don't really use my molds um, for industrial purposes, meaning you know I'm not trying to crank out hundreds of pieces out of a mold, uh, I don't think strength is a huge concern. So I will give that a try on the next thing I need to mold and report back to you. I just realized that I foolishly um, had the bottom of this of this hoof part right at the surface, which is bad because I need to fill it with resin 
and well maybe it'll be okay I just need to make it make sure it's very even very flat generally though you want a little bit of lip around the whole thing I just totally forgot to do that looks like I just barely made this wall thin enough to be able to invert it yeah there we go to, to make the removal process easier. Let's see if it pops right back into place. It does. And that mother mold is probably just enough to keep these walls uh, the consistently or as as rigid as they need to be. Well. Hmm, I'm feeling like I might want to go in and add some around here because the, the resin is going to apply some amount of pressure that may bow this wall inward and distort the mold a little bit. So, yeah, I'll add to that. Now I'm going to be really curious how well these molds work out because if they have fewer bubbles than the pore molds, it seems like this might be a both an economically uh, better option and price-wise because fr from a time perspective, it's such a pain having to build up all your clay stuff around it and that sort of thing. And so I would love to not have to do that step if I can just paint it on. I mean, it took uh, it's hard to say. I'm going to keep I'm going to time it really well next time. Oh, speaking of time, my timer has gone. I will address that shortly. But I'm going to time it to see uh, how long it takes to do a mold. I'll, I'll mold the same piece with a pour on rubber and one with a brush on rubber and see which one takes longer. Because if it's, if it's uh, close to the same amount of time, this is definitely more economical. I see one large bubble right here. But other than that, I do not see bubbles. Wow, this looks like a great mold. Yeah, like I said, my experience in the past with, with brush on molds has not been great, but um, if this, if the final product ends up as good as it looks like it's going to I may I may shift to brush on only well it looks like I got a little too aggressive with uh, pushing the mother mold into some bit of an undercut undercut there trying to find an angle that I can pry it without accidentally tearing the mold. All right. Looks relatively unscathed. Yeah, I may go in. I think what I'll do is I'll go in and sand some of these edges down where they're kind of rough and craggy from the crumpled up um, saran wrap and uh, make sure there's no serious uh, overhangs. So in here, 
you can see what I was doing, I, I had a pretty severe undercut there because when I cast this, I want to be able to kind of see some of the detail in the back because it doesn't conform perfectly to his skin. And when I put the, uh, brush the rubber on, I got the initial layer on there, the very thin one, but then the next layer didn't go directly onto that because it was so far under there, I couldn't actually see or get my brush in there. And so there's bubbles in here, meaning the skin is super thin there. So it'll be interesting to see how much that distorts when I, when I pour the, the resin in there. It's, it's along the back, so it's not going to be a big deal to clean up either way, but it'll just be something to keep an eye on. All right, is that it? I think, well, okay, here's that test that I was doing to see how it could work for Colossus skin. And uh, this is a good first pass. I'm going to sand this and see what that looks like. I've got the, um, let's see, the actual textures. Here we go. That is the kind of skin that I'm trying to reproduce. And so however close I can get to that is going to determine whether or not I use this material. It's kind of a bark mixed with lichen covered stone. So yeah, we'll see. I think this is a I think this is a promising start though because it's got it's already got a lot of inbuilt uh, grain and texture to it. I think when I sand it down so that there's flat areas that'll bring in some of those larger shapes that you see in that pattern. And of course painting it will make a huge difference as well. So let's check that out. Out real quick. I feel like if just slap on some black in the crevices, do a quick dry brush, or sorry, a quick uh, wash. Yeah, that paint's not sticking super well to the non sanded part. Let me try this again. Now, rather than uh, wiping the paint off with a wet rag, I'm gonna try to just sand off the highlights. And this is where it's super nice that the material itself is tinted gray so that I'm literally sanding down to the highlight color. Well, not the highlight color, the mid-tone color. There we go. Now let's uh, just throw a little highlight color on and see what that looks like. Try to work in some of that streakiness that the uh, texture has. It's got both uh, both globs and streaks. The streaks might have to be sanded in, I think. It doesn't look so great when it's uh, hand painted on top. It looks like brush strokes. That's pretty good. Go back in and hit my low lights again. Yeah, I'd say this is a very successful test. This looks very promising. The material's fairly cheap. It's easy to use. Uh, the only unknown I have is how I'm going to sand the peaks down on an organic curvy shape. This was really easy because I just threw it on my belt sander. Uh, but you don't want to belt sand over a three-dimensional object. Um, so yeah, I'll do a couple more experiments. I think one thing I'm going to try, I'm going to put the, um, put this, why do I keep forgetting what it's called? Put this Plasti Paste too, uh on the inside of the Colossus where, where some of the joints come together because that's a, that's a good place where it's three-dimensional and I could test it, and if it turns out to be botched, it's no big deal because it's inside the Colossus. So let's give that a try real quick. <sighs> I 
Yeah, things are getting a little tricky here. I'm not sure. Something kind of shifted where he's not just sliding in and out of his base anymore. I suppose for right now he probably doesn't need to. I can just put the plasti paste on as it is and then press it down. So let's give that a go. This is going to be a little bit scary because I need to press the torso down and so any places where the plasti paste squeezes through the saran wrap it could potentially glue the parts together which I don't want to do but if you take no risks you never lose anything pro tip number 97 always try things always lose things that's good I'm gonna finish off this can since the lids destroyed anyway I figure since he's gonna have a beard over this whole area this is a pretty good place to test it as well I'm using odorless mineral spirits to smooth it down a little bit All right, we'll see how that works out. All right, let's see if this detaches. Wish me luck. Ta-da! Okay, so here's what we got going on. You can see here, by all this dangling stuff, that um, this didn't press against the bottom of the torso perfectly. But that's fine. What's important is how well it seals around the edges. Uh, looks like in order to wiggle this out this part busted off again so I'm not sure how if or how I want to cement that down since it's so hard to pull out I mean I could I could saw these guys down a bit but then I'm losing some of the stability that comes with them being so long so I'll probably just uh, I'll keep working at it the way it is now and if it gets too problematic then we'll go to that solution. I think I might do another coat just as an experiment. I think I'll do another coat uh, with it off and then yeah so I can really build up that area and then put it back on. We'll see. Okay, and let's check this out too. So this is the uh, plastic paste that I smoothed down a little bit. And we'll see what it's like sanding that with a sanding sponge or... Hmm. Yeah, I'll have to do some experimenting to see how that works. So let's start experimenting, shall we? We shall. All right, so I got a couple different sanding sponges here to try. And a sanding paper thing. So I'll start with the roughest. Okay, so yeah, this was my fear was that the... Let's get a close look here. Is that the lumpiness is still there when you, when you use a sponge because a sponge you know, it's squishy. So it's not gonna give you that super nice, harsh uh, flatness that I got from using the belt sander. So another thing to try would be a file. Let's give that a try. I think what I'm gonna want is a sanding block, which I know I have somewhere. Sanding block. One issue I have is that the first sanding pass that I did is with this super heavy grit. I don't know what this is. This might be like 80 grit or something. And then the next one down, I think that's like 150 grit. So I would need to get a couple levels between that to really 
do a good job but since this is just a test area I'm not going to waste my time uh, so the one thing that I'm seeing is that the overall smoothness is too much when I smooth it down with my fingers to begin with I actually want it to be more rough and mottled like it is in these areas where I didn't smooth it as much so that's good to know so I will continue to iterate with this a little bit something I'm not too happy about the uh, maybe just because it's been really hot in here I'm not sure but the uh, surface quality on this new plastic paste if you can see there see how shiny that is it's actually got some kind of residue that it's sweating which certainly concerns me if that's something I'm gonna paint who knows what that's going to do to the to the paint and I don't know this might be something that I could just wash off and it'll never come back but that's something I need to watch for so I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take one of these pieces uh, scrub it off really well and then uh, leave it out again and see if it sweats anymore I mean these little blobs here so I'm going to cut them to make the spines, assuming that uh, they don't keep sweating. Well, the cool thing is, after putting all the um, plastic paste around the base of these, uh, these holder rod things, stabilizer rods, are not loose at all and I was still able to get it off with a little bit of wiggling but it seems to be working so that's cool all right so product update I emailed smooth on and they said that the, the residue that I'm getting on these guys is probably because I'm not mixing it well enough because there's some kind of oil in part B and if you don't mix it super 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 good that's what uh, sweats out of it so I'm going to do a test where I mix it super 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 good move it to a couple different containers, make sure I'm scraping all the sides and bottom super well, and we'll see how that works out. Oh hey, another thing I did, I got this product called Extend It, and what this is supposed to do is extend the life of the product that you have. So I'm gonna give that a try because this stuff is supposed to um, not have a long shelf life. So the instructions are you put the lid mostly on and then you spray some in and close it. Whoa. No idea how to verify whether this is working or not, but you know, it's like maybe 12 bucks and considering a lot of these things cost, you know, 50 or a hundred dollars for the material, it's uh Seems like it's worth the investment. If I'm going to use this stuff for the skin, I'm probably going to be doing very small batches of it at a time uh, because I'm going to want to have very fine control over it. I don't want to have to blob the material on really thick and then have to panic and get it all in the right places as it dries because it only has a 10 minute um, cure time working time pot life they call it um, so yeah I might as well practice making small batches anyway and see how that goes you know I think I'm gonna try hmm, well let's try this first if this doesn't mix up well then I'm going to try weighing it because I just I cannot get a good sense for the volume distribution they say you're supposed to mix 
the parts, uh, where's it say? You're supposed to mix the parts 62A, so 62% or 62 of this and then 100 of that. It's like, is that what those numbers are? Uh, since this, it's really hard to get it to pack down, it's super hard to say. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, we'll try, we'll try weighing it next. Okay, and we're going to do a nice, long, aggressive stir session, going through several different containers to make sure that there's no residue on the sides. Very aggressively scraping the sides and the bottom. Everyone likes to aggressively scrape bottoms. Okay, and just for the hairy heck of it, I'm gonna go to a third container. If I go crazy banana pants with the mixing here and it still has a problem, then I'll know this, I just, this material is just not going to work. So, but if this does work, then I could experiment with dialing back the craziness a bit. But okay, and on to a fourth stick. And I've probably spent about five minutes of its total pot life, so half of its life already has been spent in aggressive mixing but hopefully that will be the trick got some saran wrap down here because I found that it pulls off of that really nicely so I can probably shape this into whatever I want just with my jigsaw to get the any bony protuberances or whatever I want to make with it so this test won't be wasted if it turns out to work. Oh, the other thing I <laughs> found out uh, looking on the website was that I was using um, I was using the wrong stuff to smooth it. What was I using? I was using paint thinner, odorless mineral spirits. Now I was supposed to be using denatured alcohol or acetone. I'm going to see if I have any of that here in a sec. And I do. Denatured alcohol. Hooray for having a bunch of random stuff in your garage. Okay, let's see how this works. Uh, pour some in the cup. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that definitely works better than the... Uh, than the... Uh, Odorless mineral spirits I was using. Eh, a little better. Still, still will pull up a bit. But in general, I'm getting a nice smooth on there. See what I did there? Smooth on on a smooth on product. All right, and I'll let you know how that works in one moment. <laughs> 